Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. We have the opportunity to bring you another exciting show. This is our special program, by the way. It's called Point Count Point. And this week, we have the first in a series of, um, of sessions where we have a chance to explore the, explore the world around us. Today, we're going to take a look at Southeast Asia, the Philippines, China, and India. And hopefully, we will be able to generate some discussion among those of you in the audience. If you have any questions, I would like to actually encourage you to send your questions in because we enjoy hearing from the people that are listening to us. So let me begin by getting you uh, acquainted with our panelists this afternoon. We'll start off with uh, Srini. Srini, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Uh, my name is Srini Sitarman. I work for the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center, which is a Department of Defense Regional Center. We work along with the U.S. indo Com and our bosses out in D.C., and we look broadly across the Indo-Pacific um, uh, security issues. And uh, I'm originally from India. Uh, I did all my schooling. Uh, in India, and I did my graduate school in the United States. I was a college professor in just outside of Boston before moving here about four years back. And my re regional focus is South Asia, economics and security, and I also work tech issues, particularly AI and uh, open networks and things like that. So that's from me. I look forward to chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you, Shri. Uh, Christopher, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Cottrell. I am a Thailand-based um, independent journalist and analyst. I cover ASEAN and Pacific Islands development issues and Indo-Pacific current events. Uh, I got my master's in Pacific Islands history from the University of Hawaii, Manoa in 2002. And I spent 18 years working in media of all kinds of stripes inside of China. So I speak Mandarin and I um, watch the region literally from that perspective as well. So uh, well, glad to be on. Well, Thank you. Well, welcome, Chris. You know, what I did want to ask you is where exactly are you at this moment? <laughs> you can say I'm in Bangkok. That's fair enough. Bangkok. I was about, I'm, I'll be in Hanoi next week. Uh, actually, I, I move around quite a bit. So, uh, yeah, no one knows where oh, Chris well, is thank at. Thank you. But, uh, thank you for uh, – I'm, I'm going to ask because everybody out there wants to know practically, 90% of the people, what time is it in Bangkok? About 5 a.m. In the morning, it's now twelve as, noon in Hawaii, or as after. the crow flies. Yeah, All right. it's just a little after five, little five after five a.m. So uh, the sun's coming up. It's very beautiful here. So yeah. All right. So <laughs> we're going to move over to Jim. James, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the country that you're uh, going to help us understand. <laughs> well, I was a foreign oh, country, I should sure. say. I was a foreign service officer, a U.S. diplomat for 36 years. I served primarily in South Asia and China and Taiwan. Uh, highlights included being head of the political sections at both the American Institute in Taiwan and Embassy Beijing, and then ambassador both in Kathmandu, Nepal, and Dhaka, Bangladesh. I just recently finished up uh, six and a half years as chairman of the American Institute in Taiwan, uh, which is the nonprofit set up by Congress to manage the U.S. relationship with Taiwan after we broke relations with Taiwan to become formal diplomatic partners of the People's Republic of China. So there, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we, I, as you can see, folks, we got a really uh, extensive knowledge base right here that I want to take advantage of, so which I will start to do. I'm going to do that right now. Trini, you got the first question today because okay. it's been on my mind. You know, India recently held the G20 summit, and some of the reports that have been coming out of that uh, event have been so, has been very positive, actually, for India. Now, I understand, and, you, and this is the question I have, and uh, I understand that the, um, uh, the post-conference declaration, so however you refer to it, uh, that came out of that conference for the first time were unanimous 
mm-hmm. that all participants uh, support. Uh, tell us a little bit about how that was achieved or, and, and what it means. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, the G20 was particularly interesting because uh, I was held in New Delhi. India was first time chairing the G20, and it just concluded last week. Uh, and as you mentioned it, uh, Governor, uh, it was uh, it was a big success for India. Modi rolled out the red carpet. President Biden was there. Justin Trudeau from Canada was there. And uh, uh, Rishi Sunak, Prime Minister of Britain, was there. But importantly, what was missing, who was missing from was President Xi Jinping from China. And obviously, Vladimir Putin from Moscow was missing at that particular summit. So did those countries get to vote on the declarations? I mean, well, they 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 sent in their um, like Sergey Lavrov was there at the uh, at the at the uh, at the summit, and he obviously was taking directions from Moscow, and the equivalent of of Chinese foreign secretary was there. But what I understand is that they developed a consensus document. It was a consensus document. And the language was uh, made in such a way that it did not uh, ruffle the feathers of Russia and China. And it probably got in few words about Ukraine that the U.S., Canada, uh, and the European partners wanted it. So the consensus document, which actually was unusual because they released the consensus document on the first day of their uh, of their uh, conference, which normally they don't do. They do it at the end of the meeting, but they release it the first day. So obviously they've been working on this document even prior to the beginning of this particular summit. Uh, so, you know, tell, and, go ahead. so, you know, well, James, uh, tell me, China wasn't there, but mm-hmm. they signed on to this document. And as uh, Srini just uh, informed us, they probably were, were probably were part of some kind of a discussion prior to the, uh, the issuance of all of that. So what's, what's China's game? I mean, what, what was all that about? China's trying to thread a needle there. I mean, there is a big, uh, frankly, very rarely mentioned uh, competition between India and China for leadership of the global south, the uh, third world countries, we used to call them uh, in Africa, Latin America. Uh, and at the uh, recently, there's that friction has been picking up. The Chinese have come up with a map that shows much of a large Indian state as being part of the People's Republic of China. And so the uh, Xi Jinping didn't want to go. Uh, he didn't want to give uh, Prime Minister Modi face. So that's why he did that's not. the back story right yeah and the other part of the the other edge of the needle he's trying to thread is not to back out of a forum not to have china back out of a forum that includes a number of those third world countries that they uh, want to appeal to like for example indonesia and so the uh, I, I saw that as just a a hey look we're not pulling back entirely but going forward i think china is going to want to be most active in these multilateral forums that it controls. Yeah, I saw some reports actually that uh, Canada, which is not necessarily in your range, uh, but Canada got uh, kind of worked over a little bit by Moby uh, because of the way that I guess it's the chic issue. Was uh, do you have you heard anything about that or I other? See, what happens is that there is a part of India on the um, uh, on the western side bordering Pakistan, which is called Punjab. And you know, as you as you know, the region from what is tr- traditionally what is known as Pakistan today to Myanmar or Burma, and including Sri Lanka, was part of the British Empire until 1947. It was the Queen's Crown colony was directly ruled by Queen Victoria. Uh, and and when the split happened, the, the province of Punjab was split into two pieces. It's like Ukraine because it has a lot of, it's one of the grain producing 
largest grain producing states in the world. So there's a group of all this Punjabi started migrating. These are the guys you see with the big turban and you see them uh, uh, more commonly in the mainland and other places, but they migrated in large numbers to UK, Southern California and Canada. They've been agitating to create their own state. And there's various, and it was a big problem. It was a problem with Mrs. Gandhi in 1984, solved it. She sent in a team of commandos into the uh, Sikh temple and they took out the, uh, the, the leaders of this cell who were agitating for this. But she in turn was assassinated in 19, October of 1984. Our own personal bodyguards gunned her down. And since then, the issue kind of died down a little bit, but it has cropped up. But the argument against Mr. Trudeau is that he is not doing enough to control these elements which are targeting Indian leaders, particularly the Indian High Commission in Canada, in Ottawa, in Toronto, and other parts, and that they are, uh, they are allowing these restive elements to uh, function in the country. But my, my understanding as an analyst, not as a government servant here, to say that I think there are some electoral dynamics in why Mr. Trudeau is unwilling to go after them. And that's been a big sore thumb. And apparently, not just India, other countries also kind of gave him the sideline. Uh, yeah, to... Trudeau really didn't, didn't come out of that, uh, country, that summit too well. And here it is, you know, they, we have this great declaration, one earth, one family, one future coming out of the, 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 the summit. And, but Trudeau, uh, unlike Biden, unlike almost anybody else who attended, just didn't seem to make well. Now, one of the interesting things, Chris, is the fact that one of the, one of the countries that was uh, actually praising India, actually saying India really scored by all of this, was Pakistan. And I noticed that one of the uh, interesting things about that entire summit was that your part of the world was really not part of it, including Pakistan. I mean, um, Vietnam is not a, a member of the G20, as I understand, but Marama, obviously. How, how are they affected by all of these events? The G20 was looked at very closely on ASEAN as a hope for economic restoration in the face of what um, every, all analysts are talking about which is a cooling China. So there is engagement in Southeast Asia, hopefully for uh, tourists and business within India. And there's a lot of excitement for sure about India's uh, prosperity coming up. And that's watched very closely in the region from ASEAN perspective. Well, let me ask you a question. There's the African Union in the, uh, in the G20. There's the uh, European Union. Will we be seeing some kind of an ASEAN Union in the future? Is that anywhere? Uh I don't think that's on the cards yet, but that would certainly be something that is something uh, that will be discussed. What about uh, the where, Philippines? How, 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 I don't know. And, and what role would the Philippines play in any of this? The Philippines I, is um, actually quite strategic geopolitically and geoeconomically as it shifts um, very closely with the United States. So that's, that's where I think you would see Philippines um, rising within that ecosystem. But the Philippines at the minute, um, it's very close with Washington and signing a lot of trilateral agreements. So uh, it'll take a bit of genesis before they're at the level to talk about fully with G20. So, uh, James, Jim, you know, um, China's sitting back and seeing all of this. This is the fallout in the world. And as, uh, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's unusual or to say that China and the United States at least uh, <laughs> are in some kind of competition for mm -hmm. influence in the region. So where does China go from here and how does that affect Taiwan and the rest of the, uh, the world? Well, we've all hinted at the uh, problems that Ch China is going through economically. I mean, we're not talking a depression, but we're talking about an obvious slowdown in growth. A lot of people assume that that might make China more cautious going forward, maybe not as aggressive with respect to Taiwan or the South China Sea. I would point out we're not seeing any signs of that. <laughs> you know, the, the Wolf Warrior diplomacy uh, seems to continue. 
the exercises on the uh, going around Taiwan, threatening Taiwan continue. And I would say that uh, the real issue now is that our, our previous ways of judging China probably don't hold true anymore. We, uh, China has shifted from a collective government to a one-man dictatorship. I can say that because I'm no longer working for the US government, but that, that introduces a lot of uncertainty. We don't know how uh, Xi Jinping measures various factors. We can bet that the people around Xi Jinping, all of whom are loyalists who've gotten their jobs because Xi Jinping thinks that they're going to do what he wants them to do. All those people, when they describe the problems to Xi, are trying to figure out what Xi wants to hear. That's how one man or one woman shows work. So it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. But you can say that uh, Xi Jinping has made recovering Taiwan as one of the center parts of his rule, of his legacy. He wants to have Taiwan reunified unified with China under his rule. Uh, and he, he, he wants to leave a legacy of China being the greatest power on earth. I'll stop there. Well, uh, let me ask you a question about that, because um, the last time an Asian country wanted to, you know, ex exercise that kind of dominance in the uh, region, um, w w what happened was that uh, Pearl Harbor here in Hawaii got bombed. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, tell me, what are we looking at here? I, I'm going to bring this home, you know. I'm going to I'm going to bring it home and say that's why the fall of Taiwan to China would be absolutely horrible and threatening to US national interests. You know, the US needs to be able to get through that island chain that stretches from South Korea down through Japan, down through Taiwan importantly and through the Philippines and Indonesia if it can protect its interests. Conversely, if a hostile power can get through that island chain at will, uh, U.S. interests in the Pacific, including Hawaii, are at great risk. And that, uh, you yeah, know, we're looking at uh, the mirror image of national interests here. China wants that free access. They want to deny us access through that island chain. And Taiwan is absolutely key. If it's taken over by the Chinese, it will be run by the People's Liberation Army. They will establish the bases and the capabilities necessary to go at will any place in the Western and Central Pacific. And because of what uh, what uh, James just said, Christopher, it seems to me that the importance of some of our former enemies like Vietnam uh, and, and, and the role that they might play uh, in balancing all of this off uh, becomes more important. Vietnam uh, or it, uh, South some of our allies, like Thailand and the rest of it. What, give me a little bit of sense on the region in, in terms of this uh, dynamic. Uh, yeah, sure. There's, um, people are scared. They're genuinely scared of uh, so the dragon and eagle entangling one another. And you'll hear that in Manila. Uh, you'll hear that in Bangkok. Uh, Vietnam is trying to balance itself. Vietnam has a variety of... Um, challenges coming out of the pandemic economically. It needs to engage with Beijing for um, cross-border issues. They're neighbors, they share borders, and they uh, also they have tit for tat in what the Vietnamese call the East China Sea, so the East Vietnamese Sea, right? Um, that's one element. Uh, they purchase a lot of their security uh, kit from Russia, which is a challenge as that supply chain diminishes. Meanwhile, Washington, um, Biden, after the G20, arrived in Hanoi and signed a comprehensive strategic partnership that elevates the diplomatic status of Vietnam to a very high level. I think it's the highest level um, with the United States. Ambassador um, Moriarty, correct me on the defined titles of what that really would uh, entail. But overall, Vietnam um, talks a lot with the Philippines for more exercises monitoring coastal waters. And that's that's something that is Daily. It seems like the United States went out of its way in recent months to, uh, you know, make Vietnam uh, the new Japan, you know, the uh, former well, enemy, and now all of a sudden our best friend, you know? Well, I think since the early 90s with Senator McCain's engagement with Hanoi, which this new deal actually has continuity with, um, 
there's always been an urge um, and need to um, have better relationships to make one make up for the war, but secondly, move forward. And finally, I think we're at a neat stage of moving forward in a way that Vietnam wants to move. Um, Washington's obviously happy about this. Uh, China will always have mixed opinions about this, obviously not welcome Washington's presence on their border. Well, you know, what's interesting to me is the fact that uh, there are thousands and thousands of Vietnamese in America who yes. are uh, very clear about their continuing opposition to the, uh, the government, the communist government in Vietnam, and whose political leaning are uh, actually opposite of that uh, position. So is this, is this recent reapproachment or whatever we want to call it, how is that going to play out? And uh, this may be an unfair question, but, it, uh, but let me ask it anyway. How is that going to play out in the, in the American politics? How is that going to play out in the, what we see in America now? As it's, uh, which is a pretty divisive political scene. Okay. Uh, despite being a, an American, I get my office sometimes with the United States because I don't live there. So uh, domestically, I'm not sure what that would play out with. But yeah, it's in the news cycle. There are criticisms that human rights weren't raised, but I've seen no evidence that human rights were not raised diplomatically. The State Department has not changed its position on human rights whatsoever. So let's see if this really has um, legs going into the 2024 election. Um, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But certainly um, th those issues are all valid for discussion. Well, you know, we just talked about the fact that uh, Trudeau may have some domestic problems uh, or he, he, what his actions in, uh, in, in India may affect him politically, uh, domestically. But I'm watching the world now, and so, Trini, India must, can't just be sitting there and saying, okay, boys, play nice. I mean, they, they, they've got to be involved in this old scenario somehow in, in the entire Asian region. I mean, what is India's response in the region regarding uh, all of these other people coming in and uh, attempting to exert influence? Well, as you know, uh, and this cuts into many of the issues that Ambassador Moriarty uh, you know, alluded to, uh, and it really speaks to PRC here, right? That's really the uh, crux of the matter. India and China have a long-standing border dispute. The border dispute predates India in many ways, uh, but uh, it is with the collapse of the Qing Dynasty in 1911 uh, and the Republican China and the uh, Communist China uh, co conflict and then the ROC running off into Taiwan. At the time, Britain had a lot of this uh, control over Tibet. So in 1950 to 1959, uh, what Mao did was the PRC started asserting military control over Tibet. If you look at Tibet today, it's an occupied territory. The Dalai Lama lives in the India in Dharmashala, and the Tibetan exile government runs from India. There's a minister, prime minister, they have the exile, and I mean, there, and the Dalai Lama is 86 years old, I think, and there's going to be a next new Dalai Lama, and they don't know where he's going to incarnate, maybe Mongolia, maybe Taiwan, we don't know. The process is controlled. But the Tibetans never really posed any threat to PRC. They, they just took over that land now. And the border areas, which is Tibet's, not China's, is an India which is open, right? But China and India, once they became communist China in 1949, and India became independent in country in 1947, the borders have been clashing. They, they fought one big war in 1962, in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And since then, it's been conflictual, right? And they've, they've had major skirmishes along it. In June of 2020, 20 Indian soldiers and five PLA, People's Liberation Army soldiers, died in that hand-to-hand -hand combat up in the Himalayan mountains. Since then, the relations between India and China have broken down. India's cut off all links with China. 
did not participate in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP. They pulled out of that. So they are not in any China-centric, uh, with the exception of BRICS, which is now expanding. Uh, exception of BRICS, they are not in any China-centric uh, modes of order. So India is concerned most about China, particularly submarines now operating in the Indian Ocean and its special relationship with Pakistan, Bangladesh, Maldives, and China's putting a lot of pressure on Nepal, and Ambassador Moriarty can talk about it, and to a certain extent with Bhutan. And they're also encroaching upon Nepal and Bhutanese territory. Let's, let's, let's talk about that. Uh, Jim, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what, what uh, Shrini was just talking about, which is the, uh, the, the, the tension in the region that's going on. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the uh, folks in the Vietnamese diaspora who oppose uh, warming relations with uh, with Vietnam, and I would say the uh, the ballast there is the fact that uh, you know U.S. opposition to what China is trying to do is about the one foreign policy issue where you have broad-based support by the U.S. public and broad-based support by U.S. political parties and individual politicians. That's reflected in a lot of the countries we're talking about now. I mean, the if you see the polls out of India, if you see the polls out of the Philippines, the distrust and fear of China is as widespread as in the United States. It's, a, uh, it's tough for some countries to manage. Uh, just because China's market is so important to those countries, uh, and they many of them share borders. Nepal is a classic case. You know, I mean, China did not take much interest in Nepal up uh, up until the past fifteen years, uh, and they ended up building high speed railways into Tibet. They all of a sudden realized that, well, wait a sec, you know, India doesn't. <laughs> India has assumed that Nepal is their client state as a buffer state. We want to change that. We're not going to accept that. Uh, and so they've pushed hard. Uh, Srini is absolutely right. Uh, and frankly, I think that in some ways they're pushing too hard and they're going to get a blowback inside uh, Nepal. Uh, that's one thing that has been happening with what they call wolf warrior diplomacy is they, the Diplomats, the official statements can be so harsh and so aggressive uh, that they, the Chinese speakers end up doing more harm to their national interest than if they j just left the issue alone. Well, you know, we, you know, it's really interesting because the, uh, and yet India is aligned with uh, Russia, mm -hmm. somewhat anyway. And so you got China, you got Russia, you got this. And uh, we're going to take a short break now, but and, and we're going to bring some of this home to Hawaii. The reason why I, I mentioned some of that is that uh, very few people know, know, for example, that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs actually passed a resolution supporting free Vietnam. Uh, that was uh, lobbied. They were lobbied by, uh, lobbied by the uh, Vietnamese community in Hawaii. And, uh, and, and, and even even expanding that just to show you how all of this national, uh, international uh, intrigue uh, affects us uh, in, in a political, in an international political way, is, is the fact that uh, one of the, the Wall Street Journal just uh, uh, had an article that showing, uh, reporting how uh, China uh, is using, uh, I, I, I guess, false information, accusing uh, actually the U.S. of create, of destroying uh, Lahaina itself because it was mm -hmm. testing some kind of weapon. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously uh, a linkage. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully.
Aloha and welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii and Point Counterpoint as we discuss the world and its impact. Now we're going to know a little bit about, about how it impacts Hawaii. Hawaii is the home of the uh, major command for the United States. I think it's called, uh, what is it called this time? Christopher, you take us into this and what it means uh, for the Philippines. It used to be called Syntac, but I, I think it's uh, something else. It's Indo-PECOM. Oh, that's it. Go ahead. You are seeing all the branches of the U.S. military organized out of Indo-PECOM, whether it's Army, Air Force, Marines, Navy. And as uh, the waters are contested in the South China Sea, or parts of which the Philippines claim is the West Philippine Sea, and the Vietnamese claim has the uh, East Sea, um, as well as claims from Indonesia, um, Brunei and Malaysia, uh, you're seeing far more of Indo-PACOM presence in the region, primarily in Manila. Um, this year has been an explosive year of tensions, if you will, between Manila and Beijing. That didn't begin that way. President Marcos went to Beijing, uh, signed some MOUs, um, and came back to Manila, and people seemed very happy um, that maybe this would alleviate the tensions. It didn't. Um, I was in the Philippines for two months earlier this year when those tensions to, began to just sort of spiral, if you will. Um, there were um, fishing ships in the Philippines that got flashed in the eyes with lasers <laughs> by Chinese coastal. They've been um, hosed with cannons. And I spoke with strategic, um, the strategic analysis unit within the Philippines Coast Guard. And they explained to me that this is not new. During the Duterte administration, they were not publicly reporting that these incursions were taking place. They were using back channels. Um, that position shifted in earlier this year with uh, the Philippines Coast Guard encouraging their citizens to report any, any kind of uh, uh, incursions into their waters on social media. And the Philippines, as a social media landscape, is massive. It is extremely active with social media. So that also has been driving a lot of the well, domestic you, politics in the Philippines. You know, for us in Hawaii, it's interesting that we are, you know, the president is all, is Marcos again. I mean, you know, yes. bum, bum, what, I forgot what his, name, what, what his nickname is. Bum, bong Bong Marcos. Yeah, Here Bong Bong. You know, he kind of grew up in Hawaii. I mean, he used to, his dad was exiled here for a while, right? I mean. Mm -hmm. Correct. So anyway, it's, the the point I'm, I, 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 and I want to get back to you, Jim. I mean, um, what, how, how much trade, you know, trade has been mentioned as a possible offset to some of these tensions. How, uh, how much, despite all of the things going on, how much trade, if you know, does America have with China at the moment? I mean, uh, or during this period, uh, uh, some idea. Has well, it gone down, up? People like, uh, what's his name that runs Tesla, seems to be keep going and go, you know, it doesn't seem to affect him at all. Yes, he's been very careful to have good relations with Beijing. Uh, the trade actually went up during the pandemic. If you take the three years as a whole, uh, you know, we were all staying at home using computers and new gadgets, and a lot of those were assembled in, in China. You do have a movement now, though, uh, you know, some, a lot of small and medium-sized businesses, U.S. investments in China are pulling out just because they're too nervous about what's going to come next. Uh, they do have uh, a lot of tariffs still in place that make it harder to export back to the U.S. from there. The Chinese have a habit of uh, trying to develop local champions to take the place of cutting edge industries that are invested in China, cutting edge U.S. trade. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of businessmen who are just saying, well, wait a sec, you know, this is really hard. The market is huge. I mean, you know, you're talking about a middle class of 400 million people. Uh, the market over time becomes less attractive as local champions. And this is happening for folks like Nike and uh, Adidas right now. They're seeing the local brands take over. I think everybody's covered covering a lot about the electric vehicles now, where the uh, Tesla's place inside China is 
dropping rapidly as Chinese companies like BYD, I think that's the name of it, now build uh, you know first class electric vehicles. They've done that with a heck of a lot of uh, support in terms of subsidies and tax breaks from the Chinese government. Uh, and so, I so, assume a lot of technology from outside. So, so Srini, does uh, does India step up? I mean, uh, this uh, you know, how does all of this uh, economic wise, trade wise, what what does this mean between the U.S. and India? Well, India is doing quite a bit of trade with the uh, United States. You know, all the back office processing, uh, cloud computing. Uh, all the major tech CEOs are Indian origin, you name it, Microsoft's, uh, uh, um, uh, Google, many of the many of the major companies uh, are there. So the tech world is trying to move. Where India is probably facing a little bit of challenge is setting up those manufacturing facilities. Um, you know, moving manufacturing, and that's why Vietnam is really key, and maybe Chris can talk a little bit more about it yeah. uh, as he is from the region. So moving manufacturing has been a little bit easier. Vietnam is emerging as an alternative hub to China. So is India, but India definitely is a step behind uh, compared to Vietnam, I would say. Some of the iPhone processing is going to come to India, but Vietnam has actually got the edge on that. So pick that up, Chris. Uh, tell us a little bit yeah. about how that fits. So uh, over the course of the pandemic, um, a lot of those factories were mothballed in Vietnam. So Vietnam, this was reports coming out yesterday, are struggling in some ways to recover their factory sectors. And so there's opportunities for investment, but uh, it's not going to sweep away Guangdong province. Guangdong province is still going to be a powerhouse of manufacturing um, without question. Um, however, there is mass interest within Vietnam to restructure and continue to develop um, IT and Vietnam also is looking to India for its uh, solutions and for collaborations in IT. Um, so is Thailand for the matter. We, you know, we've, we've talked about some of these major players, but in your region of the world, uh, in addition to Vietnam, what's happening in Thailand and what's happening okay. in Malaysia and what's happening in some of those places where, you know, in prior uh, years were courted as potential partners of the United States? Okay, well, one of the biggest ones, it's almost an unspoken one, which is really important for Hawaii, but a lot of Americans recognize that there's a civil war in Myanmar. It's a brutal civil war, and refugees are pouring across the region, not just into Thailand, but into Bangladesh, into India. So there's a variety of ways that reporters are looking at Myanmar. So following what's happening in Myanmar, it's tragic. It deserves far more attention, but that is another thing that the region is um, paying attention to. Um, Within Thailand itself, Thailand has a new government. Um, this government has ended um, the dictatorship government, or that was the criticism of it, from the previous government that had come into power in a coup in 2015. So they held parliamentary elections, and the more progressive Move Forward Party um, came into power, but the way that the parliament works, their coalition fell apart. So there is a new government in power that is pro-investment, and pro everyone. They're not really interested in the larger ticks between Beijing and Washington. They pay attention to them, but th that's where Thailand is at right now. Singapore. Well, I, 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 Singapore, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Singapore is also becoming a regional option to Hong Kong. And you're seeing a lot of attention in a Singapore um, with subsea cables. So Singapore is positioning itself between this new Indo Pacific dynamic with rising India. Yes. And as some people um, de-risk from PRC. Well, just a, as a quick, you know, we've we got to add a little bit in for, uh, you know, for, for, as we say, for rating. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, Thailand had that king who was hanging out in Germany uh, with about 20, uh, 20 wives and all of that stuff. As, uh, and, uh, and in, and in, um, in Thailand, apparently you can't, you can't say anything bad about the king. But... Uh, um. The ledge mass rules have not been changed. Um, in fact, that was one of the things that the Move Forward Party was pushing for, and they lost. So people here do not do that. There's a high reverence for the, the um, institution. Uh, but in general, yes, it is illegal to do so. And with, <laughs> okay. with the penalties. 
All right, so just as, as we go through the region again, Taiwan. Taiwan, Jim, must be booming, I think, uh, given uh, what's happening elsewhere. Taiwan did great during the pandemic, and now with the global slowdown, and particularly with the slowdown in the Chinese economy, it's doing much more slowly. And so it's, uh, that's going to be a big issue for the election coming up which is going to be a huge issue in terms of stability of the entire region. Uh, you know, the PRC really despises uh, the most likely, ca the candidate most likely to win the election, who would be a continuation of the current ruling party, represent a continuation. What, what is the, uh, what, you know, Taiwan used to be, uh, Chiang Kai-shek left right. the mainland, took over 3 million Chinese, took over Taiwan. It was actually, in a sense, uh, some people think it was actually occupied. And, and, and now what you have is basically uh, uh, younger Chinese who had moved over and younger Taiwanese, and they have their own ideas. How, how, how reconcilable are these new forces with the old Chinese position, which, by the way, was espoused both by Chiang Kai-shek and Mao, that there was only one China. I mean, how, is that realistic? Well, what the uh, Taiwan body politic coalesces around is the concept that uh, you know, independence is just way too dangerous. We're never going to declare formal independence from China because that would force the Chinese to invade. And God forbid, we're never, never going to be part of the People's Republic of China because they're brutal. Uh, they're going to do horrible things to us, probably to our economy. So you got, actually, when I was there in the 1990s, you had 85% of the people say that they supported maintaining the current cross-strait relationship. And because Taiwan they, does a lot of trade with China. I, I mean... Yes. Yeah, as you pointed out, uh, you get your visa in Taiwan, right? <laughs> yeah, you no, it's it's a huge uh, part of Taiwan's market. Uh, there is caution on the part of uh, Taiwan businessmen now, many of whom are pulling back, particularly the small and medium-sized businessmen that I can, that can do their manufacturing of apparel or shoes in Vietnam or Bangladesh or Indonesia. A lot of them are getting out now uh, just because the rules of the road are unclear. The really big companies that make most of their money uh, just are desperate to find a way to appease the Chinese while continuing to do business as usual. That's getting tougher than ever before, particularly in the high tech sector, where we have a lot of sanctions uh, that are affecting Taiwanese businesses uh, that have invested heavily in mainland China. Well, I, I tell you, I tell you, um, we got a question from the audience, and th th this uh, person wants to know uh, how does all of what we have discussed, which is, with, how does that, what does that mean for Hawaii in terms of potential investment? Is there, is it realistic to look at say? Um, India, uh, any of these countries, uh, Philipp any of these countries, is it realistic to see them to see them as potential investors or market for Hawaii? Uh, maybe uh, start with Srini, and then we'll go to Christopher, and maybe Jim, you can just give us your take on the whole thing. Uh, I can tell you that. You know, in terms of Hawaii's biggest industry, which is tourism, right, they, the Indian footprint could be larger. They are looking at 1.4 billion plus people there, but Hawaii's not really in their radar because it's seen as somewhat remote and outside of their budget. And that that's really a problem. But I've been hearing stories of some movies being shot here and some of the community oh. members going to participate as, uh, you know, as extras in the movies. Some people took time off from their work to do it because they wanted to do it. Uh, I heard about it only after the fact. Uh, this was, I think, at the ranch, at the, uh, 
uh, on the uh, you know other on side the, of the uh, island, yeah, other side of the yeah. island, yeah. And uh, I forget what movie it was. Apparently, they shot a dance sequence, and it was over a couple of days or more than a couple of days. So the Indian movie industry would love to come here because the locales are exotic, beautiful. They love to shoot their dance, the dance and song sequences here. Even when I'm driving around an island, I'm thinking, hey, this would be a great, great site for a song. <laughs> so, you know, ba- Bollywood, Bollywood. Yes, exactly. Of, they can afford it. Hollywood, they're making, right? Yeah, they're making, um, they're making global films now uh, with audience and the beyond India. So they have Indian diaspora, which is very strong in mainland USA, as well as in Canada, across Europe and other parts of Asia. So there'll be a good opportunity. That, I think, is a big, big uh, opportunity. And a more a more scaled down uh, version here is, I would think, the tech sector. I know a lot of people come from India to work here, and it's, it's temporary, it's retaining. Uh, Hawaiian Airlines, I believe, is a big employer. HMSA is a big employer. Uh, Walmart is an employer. Bank of, uh, Bank of Hawaii is an employer. Many tech workers come here. So converting Hawaii or creating a base in Hawaii for tech companies, startup, uh, could be great because the location is ideal, especially if you think you want to do business with Asia. Right, and it's just you know eight hours by flight to Tokyo, uh, and you know it's, it's it's equidistant from mainland USA, roughly equidistant from mainland USA to uh, to um, uh, Japan and other places. So, so that, what about that, the that, rest of Asia? Is there is there an opportunity for investment or uh, business? Uh, Vietnam, for example, there's a. I think. There's many lessons that Hawaii can take away from the current events taking that they're transforming very rapidly and remapping the region. I don't mean the remapping that <laughs> Beijing puts out that upset Malaysia and India. Uh, but uh, Thailand is a great case study for Hawaii because it's massive tourism also. So they're diversifying their nuanced approaches to different markets, including the Chinese people. Despite whatever their governance issues might be, the Chinese uh, 400 million middle class and beyond um, want good medical care. They want good, fresh air. And Hawaii has opportunities, especially with uh, Governor Green as a doctor, to look at medical tourism as a way to diversify the tourism sector. Uh, Japan has a good model to study. So does South Korea. So does Thailand. All of these have official governance of medical tourism boards for vetting this. Um, This would also give confidence for those in South Asia, also Indonesia, who want to come to Hawaii for a longer care surgery, like cardiology, and then they stay for um, sports medicine, the aloha spirit is very calming, the organic food that you get in Hawaii. Uh, there are traditional Hawaiian medicine clinics for Lomi Lomi and these sorts of things. So putting together, I think, governance that um, um, organizes medical tourism is something I would really hope that Hawaii could consider doing across all sectors. Okay, China, China a few years ago was considered the new, the new exciting market for tourism. I mean, it wasn't that long ago when we were uh, educate, uh, encouraging uh, travelers okay. from China to come to uh, to come to Hawaii. In fact, I remember uh, it wasn't that long ago when Japan, before the Olympics, the Tokyo Olympics, was talking about the fact that Chinese were invading Japan and that they had to build casinos and all of these things. And it seems. Where's all of that? Where did, it, where did it go, or is it still there? Uh, Chinese overseas tourism still hasn't really recovered uh, much of what it ha- was doing before the pandemic. Uh, you can get different perspectives on that, but even at a lower level, it, it is still significant. Uh, I I love the idea of <laughs> medical tourism because I've seen how well it works in places that practice it. I do think that there are possibilities in terms of, you know, if we have our act together in specific tech fields, uh, this is attractive enough a place for Taiwan, Japan, uh, some of the more advanced economies to, to explore possibilities. You know, can, can you come up with a functioning model 
uh, to make make foreign investors look at uh, Hawaii, not just at Silicon Valley or the Boston, Massachusetts area. I think there are, there are a lot of folks looking for alternatives, but that takes a whole a government approach. It takes attention by the universities, uh, but it is doable. Well, Bob, just building on that comment, we have a question again from a, a member of the audience, and and he is uh, what he's asking basically is that. Uh, what what can our delegation, congressional delegation, do to uh, to enhance our own relationships with uh, promoting the kind of economic uh, possibilities that we're discussing? Is there anything anything Senator Schatz or Hirono or any of these people? Or you you know, Shri, you're with the Inouye Institute. I mean, the, 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 the father of that place would have been on all of this. Uh, you know, with, right. What? I, I, you know, I'm just thinking a slick campaign, a media campaign is necessary in, in other parts of the world. And that could be done with technology now. You know, they can run it in online or visit Hawaii kind of program uh, to attract tourism or make it a location uh, attractive for you know filming or anything anything like that uh, you know it's just I think the awareness is lacking it is that oh you have to open up the aperture and let people know that places exist here that could potentially serve as uh, you know it's a very well developed place that's got the infrastructure and the materials and the resources necessary the hotels and everything to host a large delegations uh, have it a convention center. And I think COVID played its part. I remember in 2020, in March of 2020, there's going to, there was going to be a large international relations conference right here in Hawaii Convention Center. And they had to cancel it because, you know, our, our state shut down because of COVID concerns. So I, I think we need to launch a promotional campaign at the very least. Uh, and that, I think, is going to draw people in. I was like, huh, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll think about it. Uh, it's okay. not that far. Uh, as people think it is, India is not that far. Singapore is not that far. Japan is not that far. Korea is not that far. Well, um, let me ask you, uh, you know, again, I'm just picking up these questions. We got we got some interested people out there that are actually listening to us, guys. So they're, they're sending stuff in. And one thing is, uh, for, uh, for you, Jim, uh, is, the, um, is the press doing a good job in presenting a, a balanced, uh, a balanced uh, presentation, I guess, uh, uh, around the China-Taiwan issue? I mean, are they? Uh, yeah, I think the press has gotten much better precisely because much of the press has been kicked out of China and a large portion of those kicked out, a large number of those have ended up in Taiwan, forcing them to look at uh, what things are actually going on there. With respect to what's going on inside China, it's become so much more difficult. Mm. You know, we have many fewer reporters uh, from the West inside China now. They're watched very, very closely. It's very tough for anybody who's within the government or party or even just universities uh, to have real heart-to-heart -heart conversations like the ones I used to have when I was there 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it, and the last comment on that is uh, the Ch Chinese love a saying that we have in English, uh, one man feeling the elephant, oh, the blind man feeling the elephant. <laughs> Uh, the country is so big, 1.4 billion people, you can get any sort of anecdote you want. Now, having said all that, I think the press are doing a pretty good job trying to cover the fact that China has changed. It's no longer the place where engagement opportunities seem limitless, that it's one where, you know, the national interests of the U.S. and Western slash Asian democracies in general are at serious risk, and, and it has to be treated uh, at least partly through that prism 
on most of the issues you're going to be dealing with, in, including trade and economics. Since you know. we're, we're talking about uh, Hawaii's place and all of this in this region, Chris, I, I'm a board member of the East West Center. And yes. uh, so obviously I, I, I'm taking advantage of, you know, my use of this microphone. And what, what can the East West Center do? If you, I, I'm presuming you, you know what I'm talking about. The East West Center at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. What can they do to make uh, Hawaii's place in this region a little better known? Again, um, to echo Shrini, um, a media campaign would be extremely effective um, in languages like Bahasa and Hindi and continue to hammer uh, point home that Hawaii is open. Hawaii has aloha. It's not burned to the ground Maui, okay? Right. <laughs> it's, it, it's, there's a lot of things that can be done um, to have reporters come and visit. Um, one of my mentors there was a Dr. Daniel Kwok, who used to run the China Seminar uh, lectures every month on for journalists in particular, and he did journalist training. So increasing journalist training um, on issues of the Indo-Pacific, but also from the Indo-Pacific. Already the East-West Center does bring a variety of folks um, from Vietnam. They have Indonesia, Fiji to study within journalism programs, but um, more programs like that would be helpful. And then again, a, a last point, um, we need to figure out how to diversify media businesses. Yeah, okay, I we, think got, that... we got a really quick questions. We got about a minute left. I saw real fast, real fast. Right now, India is siding with Putin, and, and this is an a, a audience question, siding with Putin and, and China. China and India are both siding with Putin in the Ukrainian situation. Where is the rest of Southeast Asia on that issue? Chris? Largely neutral. Largely neutral. I mean, okay. And um, let me see. Uh, for India... Uh, they're building. What's what's happening? Will will India step up and take over the the building of the road that uh, that uh, highway? I'm so sorry, just my mind just slipped. Does India step into any of the foreign investments that uh, China was doing that may not be they may not be doing any? Let me let me step into the previous point. India is not siding with Putin. Yeah, uh, just to put it in a historical context here, uh, you remember India is in many ways, the current Indian military is in many ways the byproduct of uh, a, a British military which leaned Soviet during the Cold War from oh. 1949 to 1989, roughly, right, uh, during the Cold War period. The military architecture of India and the military hardware was Cold War based, uh, and they run the Russian military hardware, and Russia was willing to, or Soviet Union then, was willing to sell them. So what the posture they have adopted now is, I would also say, is neutral. They do not want to make enemies of Russia, and they are buying Russian oil because it's available at half the price of global, but they're paying them in Indian rupees, right? They're not paying them in dollars. And which is becoming a bone of contention between India and Russia. So they're paying them in the Indian rupees, which does not have that much uh, usage because it is not that highly transactable. So um, they are not agreeing with Putin uh, on his war against Ukraine, but at the same time, they do not want to necessarily directly poke him in the eye because it'll have direct consequences for them. It's their national interest to not, you know, anger Putin. We are getting over time, a little bit over time, but we're getting great response from our audience. And so I'm going to real quick ask one question to all three of you. If Trump gets elected president, will any of the current situation change? Yes, no, or maybe, uh, you know, doesn't matter. Uh, so maybe Chris. It would certainly, um, uh, it, it would certainly create a different dynamic altogether, and that dynamic would be so chaotic. Uh, it would maybe not be to the best for Hawaii or American interests. I can say that. What about you, Jim? I'm a little more cautious. I look at the current China-Taiwan policy as being a, basically a continuation of what started during the Trump years. Uh, and so, with respect to the big issue. I'm not sure that there's going to be that much of a change. 
Uh, but of course, the overall things, you know, does he try to pull out a NATO or, or crazy things like that? Uh, that's hard to predict. But again, I think there is a consensus among both parties that China is a competitor that we need to deal with effectively. Srini, you got the... any thoughts on that issue? Well, I, I agree with the amb Ambassador Moriarty here is that China is going to be a persistent issue and Ukraine is going to be an issue, irrespective of who, who is the president of the United States. Uh, Ukraine, you know, the longer the war stretches out, the long and Putin now has gone to North Korea to get North Korean weapons uh, from them. If North Korea gets more nukes, that's really going to mess up. Uh, the international order in ways that we can only imagine. Um, in you know, we do these games and simulations, and we introduce the scenarios to check what we're going. So I'm actually worried about the long-running war in Ukraine, the impact on oil prices, the impact on uh, on grain supply, and how disruptive it is going to be. So whoever comes in to power, they will have to confront with major international challenges. Which, you know, in Henry Kissinger's language, you're just basically kicking the can down the road uh, until the can kind of bounces back at our face. So I'll leave it at thank that. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And especially thank our, I really want to thank our panelists for a most interesting discussion. Christopher Cottrell, James Moriarty, and Srini Sita Raman. Uh, thank you for participating with us, the audience. We have, uh, we have enjoyed having you. We will be having another one of these point counterpoints uh, in October. So again, aloha, everybody. Thank you for your uh, attention.